So thank you very much for coming and welcome to this talk, starting a UX revolution one new game at a time. My name is uh, Carmen Evia and I work as a senior UX designer. I'm a psychologist and I work in the industry for years until I discovered the relationship between psychology and user experience. Uh, it was a long time ago and it brought me to where I, uh, where I am currently working on. Uh, and this is not working, okay, he's thinking. So this is what I am currently working on, Kim. Okay, but first of all, okay, so let's play a game. Please raise your hand if any of the phrases that I'm going to quote rings a bell, okay? Are you ready? Come on, it's early in the morning. Are you a UX designer? Great, so you are going to work on the UI, right? I guess that makes you an artist as well. Okay, I can see a few hands. <laughs> nice. We, wait, we don't have time to do research. We need to have these features done now. <laughs> That's nice, a lot of hands here, nice. Next one. We can't afford to do testing. Oh, oh my God, okay. <laughs> <That's not laughs> Much more people than I expected. <laughs> Players don't know what they want, so why, why should we test, right? Okay, nice. And the last one. The feature is not polished yet. Let me finish it and then we can test it. I'm going to rise to, okay, I see people with two hands. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> so I can see that this resonates with a lot of us, right? So, um, um, we heard these things more often than we expect, don't we? So the only way to change this is starting a revolution to persuade everyone to work within this UX mindset. So, following the sociologist Blomer and Tilly descriptions of the different stages that every social movement often passes through, I'm going to share the life cycle of our UX revolution at Kim. I'm going to share how we reached this stage where uh, we, the whole team, embraced this UX mindset, starting from the stage where the concept of embedding this UX mindset was only an aspiration, followed by the, by the stage where we uh, bring the team on board to embrace this UX mindset, keeping on of how uh, we reach the stage where the team um, was working within this UX mindset autonomously, and um, how we are trying to prevent um, the team, uh, to prevent the revolution to go to this decline stage. It's natural, so uh, we are trying to prevent the team to go back to a non-UX stage, okay? So let's start. Uh, in the preliminary stage. This preliminary stage is also called the social ferment stage. In this stage is um, where um, the social movement is still very preliminary and also a little bit disorganized. So here is where uh, the people become aware of an issue and leaders emerge. In our story, one of the first leaders uh, was Miguel Tata, the creative director of the game Diamond Diary Saga. He, um, Miguel was leading the development of, of the game and he thought that UX uh, could bring the game to the next level. I totally shared this idea with him. So when he got in touch with me about a job, I jumped at the opportunity to join Kim. And this is off, I don't know, this is not working. Okay, now we're here. So together with um, a few allies, we started our revolution in the game Diamond Diary Saga. So it's a puzzle game where you have to link three or more chunks of the same color to remove them from the board. As you can see, this game involves, uh, involves gravity and other physics. So therefore, each level has specific properties and goals. So we started and we based this stage based on two main pillars, empathy and building relationships. Um, every revolution should start with an exercise of, of empathy. 
right? You cannot uh, join a team and start uh, pointing uh, them out all the problems and uh, all the things that um, um, should be solved, right? So the thing is that each team is a complex system that works in the way it does because of a variety of reasons. And also, um, the next pillar was building relationships. It's very important to work directly with the team. Uh, and this is what, I mean, especially if you uh, were new, as I was. Um, I did uh, the mock-ups, the flow, I worked with artists, with game designers, and that really helped me a lot to really um, uh, bond with the team. So that was the team, uh, best people ever, but not truly focused on UX. So the revolutionaries, we started to design a strategy tailor-made for them. So we started a few um, initiatives here, and the first one was gathering feedback. Uh, we really uh, wanted to talk with the team and to understand their uh, processes, their motivations, and the problems that they were having. And by doing so, it uh, really helped us to understand all the team dynamics that they, they had. So what we understood is like, it comes without saying, right, that launching a game um, comes with challenge. So we uh, knew that uh, the, the team told us that they really needed to be quick and to be efficient. Also, with only the quantitative data on their hands, they didn't have a clear strategy of, uh, about how to improve in the game. They also were used to their process. They were using a traditional way of working, right, without any kind of uh, testing. And also, there were a lot of misconceptions about UX. They didn't know what was UX, they didn't know where uh, they should in, include UX in their process, and also they didn't um, knew the, the, the real value of including UX in their processes. So we put ourselves in the team's shoes, and uh, we analyzed all of, all of the information that uh, they give us, and uh, we define the core problems. And with this, um, core problems we defined a strategy. So what we uh, knew is that first we wanted to give them another data point. Um, with uh, the, the quantitative data that they had could give them the numbers. Like for example, the amount of players that were living on a specific level, right? But what we wanted is to give them the qualitative data. The qualitative data could give them the, the cool answer the whys. Why are the players leaving the game? It's because it's difficult. It's because uh, they are not understanding the core mechanics. Are they frustrated? Whatever. We also wanted to give them the knowledge about their players, uh, their players' motivations, their players' needs, uh, their behaviors, especially to game designers to improve their, experience, uh, their designs. And also we want them to um, educate them about what was UX and the value that UX could bring to their, to their games. And this brings us to the next stage, the coalescence stage. Uh, in this stage uh, is where we uh, brought the team on board and raised awareness of how important it was to embrace this UX mindset. We based this, uh, this stage based on two main pillars, show don't tell and quick results. Um, here is very, um, uh, it's very important to try to, um, instead of saying how good, you know, and try to convince with words so about how good UX is, it's better just to uh, work with them and show them the benefits of your work. I mean, ac actions speak louder than words, right? And also, we knew that we needed to have a, pos a positive feedback on the game as soon as possible, because they really needed to, to launch the game. So instead of um, trying to make everything perfect from the very beginning, uh, we just uh, follow the philosophy of just do it, okay? So uh, we wanted to learn fast by failing fast. So the initiative that we started, the first one was we wanted to bring the players into the development of the game via focus groups. We didn't have a specific setup uh, in, our, in our premises, right? So what we did is to hire an external company whose facilities were very close to our offices, okay? 
uh, maybe, and we knew that maybe focus groups weren't the best um, uh, method uh, in, for that specific moment, but we went for it. We went for it because it has its benefits. In our case, um, when you um, are using, especially at the beginning, an external, um, an external uh, facilities, you uh, will not interfere with the team daily routine. Also, you don't need to ask for a special requirement, right? It's much more easier. Also, what seems like, for example, 20 players in one day, it's a very powerful experience. You know, watching them to talk about your, your game was great for, for the team. And also, uh, some of the members of the team were uh, familiarized with, with this specific uh, research method. So that um, is, uh, it, it will make your life much easier. And also, the facilities were very close to our offices, and uh, the, the, the team would be able to watch everything live. So we did it. We did a lot, uh, several focus groups. It was great because we gathered a lot of feedback. And it was um, great because it really raised awareness in, in the team. They started to understand how important it is to bring your players and listen to your players about the, your game. And also, it was great because uh, the team could design specific actions to improve the game experience. For example, what they understood is like players weren't understanding the, the core mechanics of the game. So that was the first thing that they started to, to improve. Then we started another initiative, in this case, an special one, uh, that we called the Mother's Day. Here is a like, fun fact. Right? The thing was made 100% of humans, so it's amazing, right? But as humans, um, we have an error in thinking, right? That we make us uh, commit mistakes when we are deciding or judging others. So, for example, when a player is uh, playing your game, a bias that is called the fundamental attribution error pops up. This fundamental attribution error is when you overemphasize the personal characteristics of the person that, in this case, is playing the game, and you ignore the situational factors when judging others. So what this means is, like, for example, when a member of the team were, uh, was watching uh, a player struggling with the game, uh, maybe he could start saying things like, it's because the player is tired, or it's because the player is not paying attention, right? Um, it happens to us. We, you, sometimes we blame the players of what, was, what is happening. But when it's your mother, you will never dare to say that, right? Or when it's somebody else's mother. That will not happen. <laughs> so, I mean, this is like Paul, of one of our developers, with uh, his mom. I mean, that, uh, they are so cute. So, following this idea, what we did was to ask the team uh, to invite their families, and especially their mothers, to come to our offices to play the game. So we bought some snacks, they, share the, they play the game, they share their uh, experience with the game, and such an eye-opening experience. I mean, uh, these kind of initiatives are uh, great because they really help the team to try to really understand their players and to put themselves in the team's shoes. And the benefits of this was that um, it really, the team um, were even more motivated after this experience. Also, thanks to all the feedback, okay, thanks to all the feedback that uh, our mothers uh, gave us, we again started to define specific actions to improve the game experience. And also the most important one for me, it really brought the team even closer together. So even uh, after the focus groups and the Mother's Day, there were uh, still some skeptical uh, team members that um, um, didn't um, believe yet about this kind of methodology, right? So that is why we started the next, our next initiative, that it was data triangulation. And data triangulation is when you measure uh, the uh, different dimensions of the same phenomenon, right? So what we did is like, we asked, uh, different groups of players to play it uh, at their homes, our game, for one week, more or less. So during this period of time, they had to fill a diary which contains quantitative and quanti qualitative questions, right? So after this week, uh, we um, asked them 
to join to different focus groups to share their experience with the game. So uh, after that, we analyzed all the data that we collected from the different sources uh, and the different groups. So what this trauma triangulation, uh, the benefits of this is like you're going to really have um, and gather uh, more data with a higher accuracy. And also that the findings that you are going to um, gather are more valid and more reliable. And again, for the team, it was great because it really uh, increased uh, um, the credibility of this kind of methodology uh, with, uh, with, uh, for the game. And also, they just started to ask uh, more proactively to collaborate with the UX team. So that was great. And uh, you can see here, uh, this is one of the earliest, earliest prototypes of the game. And this is how the game looks like now. So as you can see that all the feedback that we gathered and all the, the work that we did in the game really um, makes the game evolve a lot, right? So we changed especially the readability, we worked, uh, we changed the context, we changed the narrative, we changed the art and even some of the core mechanics and of course the usability of the game. <coughs> so the last but not the least initiative that we started in this uh, coalescent stage was user test. I mean, that, um, user research is not something that you should use only when the feature is finished, right? I mean, that all of you know, <laughs> know this because all of you, almost all of you uh, raised your hand uh, <laughs> earlier. So it's something that you have to use during the whole design of the process. So that's the reason that we started to, um, to do for, uh, user test. Uh, what we wanted is to, uh, uh, we started to do this user test uh, in-house. And user tests are great because uh, you uh, are going to be able to test early prototypes and even early, early concepts, right? Also, you are going to be able to fail fast. I mean, that for example, um, you are going to, uh, it's better uh, to test your design as soon as possible instead of wasting your time uh, in a feature that maybe won't work. And also, the user test, uh, at least in our case, um, didn't require a lot of preliminary planning, so they are um, quick to organize. And uh, is, if you do this user test inside, you are going to be able to involve the team during the whole process of the user test. So uh, we didn't have a setup in our offices to do user tests. And if you remember our philosophy of just do it, um, we uh, started to do user tests with what we had. We chose the cosiest room in our, in our offices, and then we started to build to test different cameras, to, te to test different setups, uh, while we were doing the user test. So we could have quick resu results as soon as possible. We also uh, invite uh, uh, players from Barcelona to come to our offices. This is the ad that we run in our games. That this was a cross promo. And it worked very, very, very well. We had a lot of responses. And this is uh, the, the user base that we are using right now. And also, um, what we did is that uh, we broadcast uh, the, all the user tests via BlueJeans, that is a video conference app. So this is great because the, the team is going to be able to, um, uh, to see uh, their, their players giving them feedback while they are comfortably uh, working at their desk, right? So, and also it was exciting because they knew that it was like real time. And with all of the information that we gather, with all of the feedback that we uh, gather, um, the team uh, rethink even the basics of the game. For example, we confirm that our players don't read at all, like zero, like nothing. So uh, usually we tend to rely a little bit on test, right? So what uh, they try to do is to explain, for example, this is an example of how we try to explain uh, the different game modes only relying in animations and uh, effects, okay? So what you are going to see in this example is how uh, the, the team tried to explain that a uh, Russian doll or a Matryoshka uh, has another Matryoshka inside, and inside this last Matryoshka, you are going to find the diamond, okay? So let's see. Mm. 
thing. So in, instead of explaining um, the game mode with text, we just uh, uh, rely on animations. And it was great, I mean, that it, this worked much better. So it was a, a very um, nice improvement. So summing up, and after all of these initiatives that we started in this stage, it was great because the, the team really um, um, started to, uh, to embrace this UX mindset, right? I remember a game designer that he was working at his desk, and then he suddenly stops and say, oh, oh my god, I mean, if, we're, if we were to test this tomorrow, our players won't understand it at all. And this is great because the fact that he stops and he voluntarily started to analyze the feature, thinking, you know, as he was the player, that is designing with, within a UX mindset. So that uh, meant that we are really, um, our revolution was on his track. So this is what brings us to the next stage, the institutionalization stage. Here is where um, the team uh, uh, is, going to, uh, is able to work within this UX mindset autonomously, without external prompts. So we based this uh, stage in two main pillars, automatic routine, state of mind, and UX is for everyone. So UX is, should be part of their daily routines. And I want to highlight the, the, the word daily routines. Also, it's a, a state of mind. UX is not something, and um, sometimes in, you know, it happens. It's not a tool that, you, that um, you have to use it you know, for once in a while. It's something you always have to have your players in mind. And it's for everyone. It's not only for UX designers or for game designers. It's for producers, it's for developers, it's for artists, it's for the whole team. So in this stage, we started the, these initiatives. The first one was trainings. I always loved this Galileo's quote that says, we cannot teach people anything. We can only help them discover it within themselves. So, following this philosophy, we started a series of trainings, and one of them was the one that we called Become a UX Researcher. So what we uh, ask, uh, we ask that not only the team, but also the whole studio, to uh, join uh, this training where they uh, where um, that they could uh, learn how to make an interview. Uh, so we teach them the basics of how to do an interview. And it was great because they also had to put this in practice. Uh, people from um, HR and marketing were our volunteers and they played their role of their players. So the team had to do um, everything. They had to do the, the, they did the research questions, they did prepare the scripts, they, um, uh, did the re report, they did everything. And these kind of, uh, you know, of trainings or initiatives are great because they really uh, help the team to understand, to really understand all the phases and the stages of uh, uh, this methodology. Uh, you will never learn something until you uh, put this uh, knowledge in practice, right? So this is what we did. And also, if in the case that, that is needed, they could work autonomously, and also it gives a close-up view of the work that every UX researcher and UX designer do. Another initiative that we started uh, were tools. So we wanted to give them tools to use it in their daily lives. Uh, for example, we hosted uh, uh, workshops where we explained them bas uh, basic concepts of psychology and user experience. After each workshop, we put all of this information inside of a page that we call the psychological seed box. So game designers could, um, uh, could, uh, would be able to, um, to, to go there and then um, just get inspired. We also did another uh, workshop where we worked directly with game designers. Um, in this case, was a, in, for, the, for the whole studio. We worked with them to, um, to make a tailor-made uh, heuristics, right? So they could use them uh, to check, for example, their, their designs, and also to work within each other to test um, everyone's designs. 
Uh, the next one also was like we worked with the team to try to improve the UX process. We uh, really wanted to um, uh, standardize when and how UX should uh, be involved during the whole process of the design. So, sadly, um, we are reaching the decline stage, right? Where everything may fall apart. But not in our case, because we are trying really, really hard to avoid this natural stage of decline. But we're really hard. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that is natural. Every revolution is going, to, um, is going to tend to go to this decline stage, right? As humans, we always tend to go back to our old habits, right? I mean, that, that happens to everyone. So, um, if you, uh, so here, to try to avoid this, what we are uh, doing is like we are building this stage based on the, these two main pillars. Share knowledge and innovate. It's important to share knowledge because um, if you want to fund the flames of your revolution, you really need to share all the work that you are doing, the benefits of your work, and also your learnings, because we also fail, right? So we ha uh, you have to share everyone, not only within, with the team, but also with the whole company. And also you have to keep uh, innovated. Uh, you have to uh, innovate in your strategy and in your processes to avoid your, uh, your team to... Um, to lose interest on what you are doing. So the initiative that we started is like US become a, a, a very important part of the company, so the UX team grows a lot. So right now, these two are the ones that I am that I, I am working shoulder to shoulder to keep the revolution alive from Barcelona, but there are like a lot of uh, UXers. Um, um, around the whole team, really working really hard to try to uh, follow this revolution. We are also testing in other games. We are um, trying to bring this UX mindset to the, one of the most important games in the company, and we are also making, uh, doing uh, UX research for them to try to help them to improve the game and to learn this new process. And also we are working with uh, other studios. Uh, what we are doing here is like, for example, it was like one month ago or a few weeks ago, we did a workshop, what we call the UX Bootcamp, where we invited um, teams from, in this case was Stockholm and Berlin, some of them are, are here, I think. Hey. <laughs> so they came uh, to Barcelona too, and, uh, and we shared all of this UX mindset. We shared how we are trying to uh, design games in a player-centered uh, design way. And also, we, are, uh, we shared with them uh, the best practices of all the, the research methods that we are, are, um, were starting to, to use. And also, for example, um, here in London, we came to London like six, weeks, six months ago. And again, we shared with, um, with the teams here in London uh, what we were doing and how we are trying to you know, make everyone to embrace this UX mindset. And it was great because right now they are running a lot of um, user tests uh, for their games and they are doing like a great, a great job. So, I am reaching the end of my presentation, hopefully on time, right, okay. <laughs> so, um, I want you to, to leave this talk at least with a few takeaways. So, you can... I spoiled the second one, that's okay. You can revolutionize UX by, by working one step at a time. To win, you must be creative, even asking your mouth for help, right? Success means UX will become a part of their daily routine. Okay, and revolutions are contagious. One team can spread UX to many others. And the last thing, just the last thing that I want to share is uh, I'm going to use somebody else's words, okay? So you never change things by, whoops, by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So thank you very much and questions are welcome.
right. Thanks. Please wait for the microphone to come to you so we can record your question too. Hi. Um, following all the changes that you made in the game, when the game launched, did you see improvements in maybe retention compared to games previously launched by King? Yeah, we were doing these changes in every playtest, and what we saw is like uh, when we started to um, to work within this new process was in playtest four more or less. So what we saw is like in every playtest, every change that we uh, made based on players' feedback really increases retention. So yeah, it was we were checking all of the work that we were doing in every playtest. But compared to uh, older games from King who are not doing user research, was was it did this yeah, game I mean, perform we, better? We were com we were com uh, we were comparing with uh, the work that uh, has been uh, that they did in the previous playtests and also uh, in some of the other games. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Uh, Hello. I'm James from uh, Wargaming UK. We've only just set up. We've only just started recruiting for UI design. Uh, we're in the paper design phase. Have you got any advice for a team that's still in the paper design phase and hasn't yet got a UX designer on board? Can, can you repeat it? Because I, it's super... Okay. I, I cannot hear... <laughs> sorry, I'll start again. Ah, that there you go. Better, that, this you. one's working now. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I'm um, James from Wargaming in the UK. We've only just set up. Uh, we're in the paper design phase. We haven't recruited a UX designer yet. Uh, we just started that. Um, have you got any advice for a team that are in the paper design phase, uh, are really passionate about UX, uh, but haven't got their UX designer on board yet? I mean, that, uh, right now, for example, I'm going to use uh, um, the example of, of what we are doing. There are a lot of teams that don't have like an embedded UX, um, UX researcher uh, there or UX designer there. So at least for now, what we are trying to do is like to learn the, the basic, uh, you know, following the, the philosophy of just do it. That, that, that's all, that, just do it. So uh, uh, I will recommend to the designer or someone that is, you know, engaged with this, even if it's like early prototypes in paper, we are also doing that. So um, go there, uh, bring whatever you have uh, in, uh, around the office, you know, a camera or whatever, and start doing that. For example, at the beginning, we even started uh, doing tests with people uh, around the office, at least, you know, for uh, the game designer that was trying to do that, because we also tried with, you know, to, to, uh, for, with game designers to be the moderated. Um, just, you know, with, with the company, within the company, for them to start, you know, practicing and then open uh, the, this test to, the, you know, our real players. But at least learning by doing. It's not going to be perfect at the beginning, it wasn't for us. <laughs> so, but at, le at least we were learning a lot in the process. I don't know if it, this helps or not. <laughs> Uh, ah, so. um, uh, hello, I'm Hui Jing from Resolution Games. Uh, I'm also a player researcher. I got a question, uh, like uh, in your presentation, uh, because you mentioned about uh, you, you kind of like conduct some play test. Uh, I just wonder, like, who uh, conduct this kind of play test? Uh, if it's team members, because uh, if it's team members, how do you avoid the bias? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. oh, this is my darling. You cannot say no yeah. to to my game. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean that, that 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 we know that that will happen. We have two things. When we when I am talking that team members also conduct conduct this user research. In this case, the users were the game designers, not the players. You know, it it was more like an exercise for them to uh, you know to try to understand and to work uh, the empathy with the players. Uh, in, in other cases, it was me. We have uh, also a UX researcher here that is conducting uh, uh, also uh, almost uh, all of the research for other games. But when we try to uh, make game designers uh, to moderate, it's more like uh, an experience for them that to really to collate uh, real data. I mean, that of course, this data is useful, but it's, it's not going to have the same quality as uh, someone without a bias is, going, is conducting the, 
their research. But it's a very good exercise because then is when they start to really, uh, while they are designing a future, they are already uh, thinking on, oh my God, maybe this they're not going to understand because I remember this user <laughs> that I ran, that it worked very, very bad, blah, blah, blah. So it's, yeah, they are like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the user test phase is more like uh, you conduct some user test based on the designers. Uh, that, uh, yeah, so, sorry? Uh, uh, so you, you meant that the users actually is the kind of uh, teammates, uh, team members, ah, right? Yeah, no, yeah. We did, when we did uh, this uh, workshop, yes, the users were people from the, from the studio. Yeah, and this is, uh, we did this at the beginning for trying to make everyone understand what's a user test because their knowledge uh, wasn't like, you know, they didn't have very clear what was uh, all of this research methodology. So uh, this is something that we did at the beginning and uh, we built everything mm -hmm. with this feedback. So yes, it was people from the office at the beginning. And also user test. Uh, you mentioned that after uh, data triangulation, there is date like user test phase. And yeah. that is a real user. Yeah, yeah, with this with real users. At the beginning, it was people from the office, we teach them what was, and then uh -huh. uh, with real users. That oh, yeah, uh, in that user, like, test the face, uh, who will conduct this user test? Will, will you hire some company doing ah, this? No, we did it, uh, sorry, we did it via cross-promo in our games. Yeah. Uh, the players were playing the game, and then they had an ad, they tap and then um, 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 contact with us. So we are the ones that are contacting with, you know, in this database that we have already, okay. we contact with them. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so. <laughs> okay. How are we doing? Ah, thanks. Thanks, Dave. Hello. Hey. Um, I had a question, you mentioned you had the user tests um, and you did them at the prototype stage, but you also mentioned you did them for design concepts. Uh, how, how did that work, uh, doing the tests for concepts? Uh, so, f I mean, we did several, like, when I, I probably I can show you, like, for example, we uh, tried to, I don't know if you remember one of the slides, because I think that it's going to be much better. Uh, this one, yeah. So for example, this was a test that we did to test, um, uh, we wanted to change a uh, one of the features, okay? I cannot give you a lot of details, but <laughs> we were trying to test a feature and this is soda. So what we did is like, uh, we wanted first to understand their mental models about all of this stuff that we have there and also um, we wanted to try to, um, to make them, we made them build a feature with the things that we uh, gave them, right? So at least we, uh, with all of this information, and we test the concept of uh, our preliminary design. And you know, we try, we improve it a little bit, taking into account the, the mental models that they had with the different elements, okay? I'm sorry because I cannot give you a lot of details, but it depends. So, for example, if we want them to, to, if we want to learn what they think about something specific, about, I don't know, paging in the game, right? So we do this, some kind of card sorting, and based on that, we think of, you know, about different strategies, things like that. It depends on what we want to test, but it can be something very generic, or even super basic mockups. Thank you. Sorry. Hello. Hi. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Uh, so I'm wondering how long did this take? Um, so uh, I joined, joined Kim two years, more than two years ago. So around less than, less than two years because we started like from the basics. You know, with something very small, and, we, and then we build over that. But as you can see, like the journey is uh, very big because we uh, first we started to do this kind of focus group, something very simple, and then we built more and more and more. And now it's a lot of games are starting to do in this user research. But around two years. So uh, follow up question to that is: Do you think that there was a time during this process where things were moving too quickly for the team, or too slowly? 
like in um, terms of pace? Maybe if it's very easy sometimes, you know, to go to you know to think on the past and, and think all the things that you can you could improve. Uh, but maybe sometimes we could even uh, go quicker. Probably, we went we were trying to um, to be very you know polite. When I am saying that you have to try to understand the team, we spend also a lot of t a lot of time trying to understand you know their dynamics, because. For me, I don't want to just jump in that team and start to say, okay, so we are going to do things in my way, blah, blah, blah. So we are trying to be like more, you know, like more polite and trying to build things very slow. Maybe it could be quicker, maybe. So for me, that's a, if I, probably if I, I will tell my, the Carmen, you know, in the past, that maybe she could be a little bit more. <laughs> but yeah, probably yes, I mean, that it, it depends on the team. If they are open, just go for it. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, you mentioned a lot about uh, dealing with misconceptions of UX and getting kind of buy-in from people like the developers, the people who would have to exercise a lot of these things or leverage the actual stuff you're learning. <laughs> um, how did you uh, tackle that kind of problem when it came to people that perhaps weren't concentrating on things like the game mechanic? Like, how did you justify, if you like, the, the value of UX beyond just a, a kind of way of thinking to people who are making, say, financial decisions, like saying, okay, that's a great idea, mm. but I'm actually asking you for a big pot of money that you weren't planning on spending before, yeah. and I'm asking you to spend it on something you don't quite yet understand. Could you talk a little bit about some of the ways that you helped them understand the value yeah. of investing effectively into this? Uh, for, uh, at the beginning, it was like, okay, so we wanted to make things in the, you know, without wasting a lot of money. We didn't ask for a lot, a big budget. So we try to work to do things in the simplest possible way to get the maximum uh, amount of positive results. So this is something that no one can, can deny, right? When you do a user test and an A-B test and then you see that um, the parts of the design that, ha uh, that worked within this UX mindset, it's much better, they are starting you know, to, get, to pay attention to what is happening here. So uh, we try to build from the bottom to the top instead of in the opposite way. So at least this worked for us. Uh, you know, try, we don't have a setup. Okay, we are not going to ask for a you know, big lap or whatever. We, are, uh, we uh, wanted uh, to start with what we have, then gather positive results, and then go to these people and say, hey, this is working. So. Uh, then, are you going to help me with the next steps? Yes or no? <laughs> and then they say yes, and then a little bit more, and a little bit more. At least it's how it uh, uh, works for us. Just little by little, because if not, it's going to, what, what is happening? <laughs> okay, we're out of time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.